Clinton. Good morning, everyone. I am Gina Abercrombie Wen Stanley, the Vice Chair of the Board of the Middle East Policy Council. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this, our 103rd Capitol Hill Conference, virtually, of course. Our topic today is Transition Issues for the 117th Congress and New Administration. After an astonishing four years, we have turned the page on presidential leadership, in style certainly, but how much have we changed when it comes to priorities and positions? The new Secretary of State has laid out a list of issues he intends to take a hard look at, undesignating the Houthis as terrorists, how to get a better nuclear deal with Iran, how to get the United States out of the Saudi-led war in Yemen. But he has also signaled support for the normalization agreements between Israel and the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, if not the price tag for us. So where should we expect the new administration to give priority attention? How might they approach the internal conflicts complicated by external players that are currently simmering? And what might be effective to prevent their expansion into more widespread humanitarian catastrophes? How might the president's intent to center diplomacy and our policy, policy decisions play out? Will it lead finally to a rebalancing with our military? Well, we have a panel of experienced policymakers and subject matter experts to lead us through these questions and others. They will lead us in an examination of what might be expected as the new administration confronts the challenges and opportunities that face US policy in the greater Middle East. However, before I turn to today's program, I would like to say a few words about who we are. The Middle East Policy Council was established in 1981 for the purpose of promoting dialogue and education concerning the United States and the countries of the Middle East. Our, we have three flagship programs, our quarterly Capitol Hill Conference, such as today's event, our quarterly journal, The Middle East Policy, which enjoys a strong reputation among those with an interest in the Middle East and can be found in some 15,000 libraries worldwide. Our educational outreach program, Teach Mideast, which provides educational resources on the Middle East targeted mainly toward the next generation, teachers and students. So please visit our website, www.mepc.org and our Teach Mideast program on the web at www teachmideast.org to learn more about our organization and our activities. Now to today's event. I am pleased to welcome all of those who have joined us from around the world and the conference proceedings will be posted in video and transcript form on our website, as will a recap of the discussion. An edited transcript of the program will be published in the next issue of our, join, of our journal, Middle East Policy. Let me now briefly introduce our panelist. We will begin the program with Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman, who is currently a visiting fellow in international diplomacy at the Brookings Institution. Ambassador Feltman has deep Middle East experience, including service in Lebanon, Tunis, Amman, and Baghdad. Prior to joining Brookings, he was an Undersecretary of International Affairs at the United Nations and former Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. I first met Jeffrey when he was doing brilliant work as a young economic officer while covering the Gaza Strip. Next, we have with us Ms. Nagar Mortazavi, a columnist for the Independent Newspaper and host of the Iran Podcast. She is a former TV presenter for Voice of America and a commentator on Iran for international media. The Guardian newspaper has named her one of the top 10 people to follow on Twitter for Iran commentary. Finally, we have with us Ambassador Chaz W. Freeman, who is visiting scholar at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. 
a giant in the diplomatic corps. He is a former US Assistant Secretary of Defense, Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Acting Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs and Acting US Coordinator for Refugee Affairs. He is a much sought off speaker, sought after speaker, as well as the author of five books on statecraft and diplomacy. Ambassador Richard Schmier will wrap up our panel. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. The program will begin with each panelist delivering brief opening remarks and will be followed by a discussion session that will be moderated by my colleague, Ms. Basima al Hussein, Executive Director of the Middle East Policy Council. For anyone wishing to ask a question, please email your questions to mepc.press at gmail.com during the program. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ambassador Feltman. Jeff? Ambassador Abercrombie, Win Stanley, Gina, it's great to see you. Um, and I wanna thank the Middle East Policy Council for inviting me to join this, but Gina, I've got to correct you. When you were special assistant in Deputy Secretary Eagleburger's office, we met then, before we had the privilege of, of working together um, in the Gaza Strip. When I was working on East, assistance to East European assistance and you were, up, you were up on the stratosphere on the seventh floor, we met then. But it's great to see you again. And it's wonderful to see everybody else. And I really um, am honored to be part of this and to, to be appearing with such distinguished fellow panelists. In my opening remarks today, I want to touch on Libya, Syria, and Lebanon, but I also want to start with the alarming developments in the Horn of Africa because there's a very strong connection between the Horn and the Middle East. You know, wars in Syria, Yemen, and Libya demonstrate clearly that unresolved conflicts generate transnational terrorism, create humanitarian catastrophes, provoke migrations that disrupt political life, far from the, from the battlefield. And they also become theaters for proxy, for proxy wars where our adversaries such as Russia and Iran can, can extend their roots deeper into the local environment. So given these lessons, given the lessons of unresolved conflicts, I believe that the Biden administration and the new Congress should prioritize conflict prevention and prioritize conflict prevention starting with the Horn of Africa. You know, with Ethiopia's population alone, more than four times that of pre-war Syria, 110 million people in Ethiopia, conflict in the Horn could make Syria look like child's play by comparison. Now, the most influential players in the Horn are across the Red Sea in the area we're discussing today. We need urgently to transcend the bureaucratic geographic stovepiping between Africa and, and Near East. It's, it's that stovepiping is both in our foreign service and in our, in our military combatant commands. We need to engage the Gulf countries, Egypt and Turkey to stabilize the Horn of Africa now before it's too late. What am I talking about? I mean, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's military assault in the Tigray region has opened a Pandora's box, including over 50,000 refugees fleeing to Sudan, Eritreans being forcibly repatriated to uncertain fates in Eritrea, Eritrean forces on the ground in Ethiopia. Ethiopia's Aroma region is restive and there's shocking ethnic massacres that are reported in Ethiopia roughly every two weeks. Ethiopia and Sudan have clashed militarily, causing casualties on both sides over disputed farming areas along their, along their shared border. Somalia's president shares Abiy Ahmed's desire for very strong central control, putting him at odds with powerful provincial leaders. Elections scheduled in both Ethiopia and Somalia in 2021 this year are likely to provoke violence. Sudan's transition remains fragile and Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia are quarreling over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. There are dangerous tensions that are escalating between Somalia and Kenya. Any one of these issues could explode into, into crises with dire strategic implications for our friends in the Gulf and even for us. Now our go-to partners to try to prevent a meltdown in the Horn of Africa are in Africa. But Ethiopia has brushed aside African Union mediation efforts and the sub-regional organization um, that covers the Horn of Africa, the EGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development has been severely weakened as authoritarian leaders in Ethiopia, Eritrea and Somalia draw closer at the expense of the, the wider collective. 
So I conclude that US coordination with African partners is important, but insufficient to prevent a crisis in the Horn of Africa. We need to look East. The UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey all exercise extensive influence in the Horn. The UAE, and not always constructively, the UAE um, Turkish regional rivalry has played out dangerously and Somalia has affected the transition in Sudan. At the same time, the UAE in particular has cultivated close relations with the leaders of Ethiopia and Sudan, in addition to the long-standing strong ties Abu Dhabi has with Cairo and Asmara. In other words, the UAE can talk to, talk to virtually all these players. And it's likely that Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed can more readily reach the Horn leaders than other African leaders can. Khartoum has, has encouraged the UAE to play a mediation effort um, to work on the problems between Asmara, I mean, I'm sorry, between um, Sudan and Ethiopia. So preventing catastrophe in the Horn requires us to add or even prioritize African issues on our already busy bilateral agendas with our Gulf partners, with Egypt and with Turkey, and persuading our Arab and Gulf partners to stop competing with each other in the Horn, but instead work with us to promote stability in the Horn, you know, I don't think it should be an impossible sell. Chaos in the Horn and its impact on Red Sea trade and migration affects their interests even more directly than ours, but this is gonna require US focus. Now let me turn to Libya. Given the 2012 Benghazi, Benghazi murders in the aftermath, you know, the Biden administration and the new Congress may recoil instinctively from engaging on Libya. But Libya's chaos affects global oil markets, it divides our European allies, it complicates counterterrorism efforts in Mali and elsewhere, it pits our Arab and Turkish partners against each other, it deepens schisms inside NATO as we saw in some French Turkish standoffs, and it facilitates Russian expansionism. Just as in 1805, when President Thomas Jefferson deployed the Marines against Barbary pirates on the shores of Tripoli. So today, we have strategic interests in Libya. So I think that we need to support actively the fragile but encouraging developments now underway. Libyans are starting to transcend their geographic, their tribal, their ideological, and their political divisions. If the United States puts its muscle behind these talks now underway, Libya has the potential to become a success story at last. In October, a joint military commission consisting of five officers from the, from the West, the ones that are affiliated with the Tripoli government, and five officers from the East, affiliated with General Heftar and other militias in the East, known as the five plus five, converted a de facto truce that was, that was in place in central Libya since June into a nationwide ceasefire that has largely held. The Libyans have restarted oil production and exports. They've implemented a series of confidence building measures across these various divisions, including resumption of flights across the country. They've developed a political roadmap that, that, will lead, that is supposed to lead to elections. It has some important benchmarks in, in the coming weeks. And, and they've addressed economic um, distortions, including through measures like unifying the, the exchange rates. And the UN, especially a former US diplomat, Stephanie Williams, who's now the acting UN special representative of the Secretary General, the UN deserves real credit for effective facilitation. But the point is these processes and their conclusions have been Libyan led and Libyan owned. So right now it's the outside powers, not the Libyans who pose the biggest dangers to this momentum. The Russians deny having forces on the ground despite the presence of the Wagner Group. The Turks set a governmental request for their armed presence and the UAE just ignores criticisms of its role. There are no signs that these countries intend to abide by the unified Libyan demand to withdraw their forces. The United States is the only conceivable power that might be able to forge consensus for collective foreign troop withdrawal as the Libyans have demanded and compliance with the arms embargo that the UN Security Council put in place in 2011 and has renewed ever since. Ironically, Washington's relatively hands-off approach regarding Libya in recent years gives us an advantage today. 
renewed American engagement will enjoy widespread credibility among the Libyans because Washington is not viewed as having tried to exploit Libya's misery in order to score points against adversaries of the proxy battle or to, or to take or to, or to seize commercial advantage. So strong American backing of the Libyan's own processes and demands can raise the political costs to external would-be spoilers and strengthen the fragile but promising ceasefire and political dialogue. This is the most promising moment in Libya since Libya descended into chaos in 2000, 2014. And we, shouldn't, we should not overstate the strength of the current processes, but we also should not miss the opportunity to build momentum. Now we turn to Lebanon. Saad Hariri is yet again trying to form a government, but let's keep our expectations low. Hezbollah will use all means to protect its interests and avoid public accountability. Lebanese politicians who otherwise loathe each other will hold hands to protect the sectarian spoil system that sustains their power, despite the popular outrage over Lebanon's financial implosion and the Beirut port explosion. Short of a new Hezbollah-Israel war, which neither, neither party seems to want for now, Lebanon's not gonna fall into the top tier of our foreign policy concerns. The probability that the Lebanese government will again fail to deliver comprehensive reforms means that no one's gonna be expecting us to pressure the IMF to bail out Beirut. But Lebanon's geographic location and its human capital pose strategic risks to us. Without some glimmers of hope, pro-Western entrepreneurial and educated Lebanese will immigrate and they're already starting to do so. This will deprive the country of talent, and more important for us, political and social counterweight to Hezbollah. Hezbollah supporters do not have the same exit options. In a country that's as politically divided but strategically located as Lebanon, we should not be shy about helping pro-Western Lebanese succeed at home as readily as they inevitably do when they emigrate. Fortunately, a successful model exists for how to get funds, expertise, and business practices into the hands of pro-Western entrepreneurs. We can emulate the 19 US capitalized enterprise funds that were set up with strong bipartisan support after the Cold War, and the more recent Egyptian American Enterprise Fund. Guided by the lessons learned from the previous funds, a Lebanese American Enterprise Fund can, among other things, attract equity co-investors to Lebanon and provide development capital to small, and medium-sized Lebanese enterprises currently started with cash. Support to Lebanese entrepreneurs would in turn complement American assistance to the independent educational institutions such as the American University of Beirut, the US Partnership of the Lebanese Armed Forces, the Middle East Partnership Initiative Promotion of Civil Society, and US-funded humanitarian programs. I mean, the point of these initiatives is to strengthen the forces inside of Lebanon who resist being part of the Hezbollah, Damascus, Tehran axis and provide incentives for them to stay and serve as a counterweight to Hezbollah. If all the Western aligned and Western educated Lebanese leave, then the remaining population will be dominated by Iranian proxies, by Syrian criminal networks and desperately poor people in a strategically located country. This is not in our interest. Finally, a couple words on Syria. This week, UN Special Envoy for Syria, Gare Pedersen, has convened the Constitutional Committee in Geneva, part of the UN's Geneva process. This is composed of representatives from the Syrian government, the opposition, and civil society. Now, no one should expect a breakthrough in terms of building confidence between the parties or advancing toward the free and fair elections that were called for by the Security Council in passing Resolution 2254 in 2015. But in the meantime, eight out of 10 Syrians are now reportedly living in poverty. Relatively speaking, the military situation on the ground is as calm as at any time since President Assad's brutality transformed what had been peaceful process, peaceful uprisings into civil war. But the situation remains extremely dangerous. Now, given that Assad, with support from the Russians, Iranians, and Hezbollah, has withstood the worst of the civil war, Regime change is wishful thinking, at least in the short term. It's not a realistic policy option for us. So the question is whether behavior change to address the problematic aspects of the Syrian regime's policies from strategic to humanitarian to human rights is possible. I'm a skeptic. 
But given how nothing has worked to address our concerns, I think now we should provide a new test to Assad. Let us prepare a step-by-step -step transactional roadmap that's released publicly that shows the beleaguered Syrian population what we would be willing to do in terms of humanitarian aid and reversible sanctions relief in response to tangible and verified Syrian government steps towards reform, respect for human rights, decentralization, good faith participation in the UN's Geneva process, you know, and so forth. How far we would go would depend on Assad's willingness to make change. In the whole world, including the Russians, including the Syrian people, including those elite members of this, of this um, around Assad would witness his reaction. As I said a moment ago, I'm a skeptic, but I think this is worth trying for with the exception of the successful anti-ISIS campaign in Northeast Syria, our Syria policy through two administrations has not produced positive benefits for our interests or for the Syrian people. I know I've just touched on the issues that affect our interests in the, in the Middle East, North Africa today. I look forward to the analysis of the other panelists and to our subsequent exchange. Thank you again to the Middle East Policy Council for including me today. Thank you so much, Ambassador Feldman. Uh, Ms. Mortazawi. Thank you so much. Thank you for that kind introduction and to the council for holding this important and timely event and to my fellow panelists. Um, so I'll try to keep my remarks brief and I'm happy to answer any questions later. I'm going to be focusing mostly on Iran, uh, domestic and foreign policy and also prospects for US-Iran diplomacy, which is something President Biden has promised. Um, I want to talk about two important dates coming up, actually three basically in Iran. The most important is the Iranian presidential election coming up in June, which would be the end of the current, uh, current president's second term or end of his presidency. And Iran is going to have a new president. And then this administration will end office basically in August. And that leaves, uh, as I see it, a very short window of opportunity for the Biden team, the Biden administration, to basically try to restart uh, diplomacy with the current administration or the current team uh, that's at work in Tehran. And importance of that is that this is the team that was responsible for the negotiations and for making eventually the 2015 nuclear deal. So it would be just so much easier and faster for that team. And also we know here in the, at the White House or in the Biden administration, we have a lot of people uh, from President Obama's administration or people who were involved in the nuclear negotiations or the JCPOA with Iran, people who know Iranian officials on the other end, people who have been part of the negotiations and who just um, can basically pick up where they left off. So this Open, has opened a very um, short but important window of opportunity for Washington and Tehran to be able to resume uh, talks and negotiations and, as I said, again, pick up where they left off. The third important date is in February, February 21st, when the Iranian parliament, currently controlled by the hardliners, because Iran had a parliamentary election last year and the hardliners took control from the moderates in Iran. And um, the Iranian parliament has passed a legislation that basically mandates um, the nuclear program to expand, to reduce some of the inspections and to expand the nuclear program. And they've, uh, despite the opposition of the current administration, which would be the moderates in Iran, it's basically a signal or sort of a deadline for for the administration to be able to resume the nuclear deal and um, eventually the, the goal for the Iranians is to, uh, to see sanctions lifted or eased. And if that doesn't happen, uh, this February 21st uh, is sort of a deadline that the hardliners are, are holding over the head of the moderate. So this leaves um, a very critical time for the Biden administration. We know that President Biden has said multiple times on the campaign trail and some of his top advisors that he intends uh, to return to the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, which President Trump 
uh, exited back in 2018 and then replaced it with what, what his administration called this campaign of maximum pressure. Um, but the time is of essence. I think this is something that we still um, haven't seen or it's unclear how much of a priority this is going to be for the Biden administration. It seems like the signals coming from Tehran is that the Iranians are ready, although there's also this uh, sort of a game between Washington and Tehran going so far as, as we've seen in press statements and op-eds written by officials that each side is going the other one to go first. So the Iranians, their argument is that the U.S. is the party that left the nuclear deal. So the U.S. should return to the nuclear deal first before Iran can scale back its violations of the deal. And we've heard um, not very clearly set out the sequence that the Biden administration is looking at, but just this week we heard from Secretary Blinken um, what seemed like he is expecting Iran to first abide by the limits of the deal and then um, for sanctions to be lifted. So the sequencing and the timing is something that's very critical here. Um, Although it seems complicated, it might be difficult, but it's not something that we haven't seen in the past. This is also important to point out when the nuclear negotiations uh, were happened, the very intense negotiations for, for a few years uh, under the Obama administration, um, initially Iran and the world powers, the P5 plus one, uh, came to an interim agreement, which was called the JPOA. And then that was basically agreeing on the sequencing on how they were going to do the final deal. And then Iran started scaling back its nuclear program. And then when that happened, a few months later, the parties announced the final deal or the historic nuclear deal or the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So that is something that um, I see could be a similar path for what we're seeing now, although it can happen much faster because back then when the Obama team was negotiating with Iran, there was no nuclear deal. They were building it from scratch basically. But right now there is a nuclear deal. It exists on paper, it's been negotiated and it's just a matter of returning for the United States to return to the deal and for Iran to go back within the limits of the deal because technically Iranians haven't really left the deal yet. They're just started violating the limits of the deal, increased enrichment of uranium and um, basically as they see it started to create leverage for, for a potential return to diplomacy. Um, there's also Europe. The role of Europe is very important to note here. The Europeans, U.S. as closest partners, basically European powers, uh, namely France, uh, Britain, and Germany, have tried very hard in the past few years under the Trump administration. First of all, the Trump administration left the nuclear deal despite their opposition. Um, the Europeans were not on board uh, with that decision, and also the campaign of maximum pressure, which was essentially all pressure, piling on sanctions, and no real path for diplomacy with Iran, the carrot and stick situation, which only had a stick, but no carrot. And then, but then at the same time, in the past few years, the Europeans have played a very important role and tried at least politically to save the deal. As, as we say, the nuclear deal is kind of on life support, but it's not dead yet. And that's thanks to the Europeans. The Europeans haven't been able to make up for the economic loss for the Iranians of of uh, that, that has been created by US sanctions, not as much as the Iranians expected, although they came out uh, in support of the deal very strongly when it came to their political statements. But as far as um, being able to standing up to US economic sanctions as the Iranian side would hope, it hasn't happened as much with Europe. Although I want to mention two uh, special uh, financial mechanisms in Stex, which has been created by Europe. It's a sort of a barter system, uh, whereas to a, a legal way, I would say, to go around US sanctions and, um, and essentially have companies be able to exchange goods in Europe and then in Iran instead of paying each other so that some form of trade can continue to happen. But the transactions through that system have been very limited and not as much as the Iranians hoped. There's also a Swiss uh, humanitarian channel that was created with the help from, from the United States, but that has also had very limited 
uh, transactions. And currently, uh, where, where Iran's uh, very critical, or I would say the Iranian people, the population is under very critical pressure is because of the pandemic, of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Iran is the epicenter of the virus in the Middle East. Uh, we've seen certain countries in the region who saw the virus even introduced to them from Iran or through travelers uh, to Iran. Iran was one of the first countries to have a breakout after China and the uh, COVID situation has uh, been pretty bad. So the economic hardship that they have has also um, pressed the government in, in how to deal with COVID and the lockdowns and basically being able to to uh, support the population um, under sanctions. And then also there's been some limitations on getting medical devices and protection, uh, protective equipment needed for COVID. International organizations on the ground have been dealing with some issues due to US sanctions. So I think to basically to wrap it up, to restart diplomacy, one of the things that the Biden administration, President Biden can do is to have taken an initial step of goodwill. And this, we know the administration is reviewing sanctions on, certain, on, a, on a number of countries, including Iran, and how san US sanctions may have affected the COVID situation. So if some uh, easing of sanctions uh, happen and we ensure the uh, Biden administration ensures that uh, medical help can get to Iran to help with the COVID situation, that can be one step. There's another step that I think uh, can be very critical and symbolic that essentially it's not a step because it's through the IMF. Iran has requested for the first time since the 1960s, requested a loan uh, from the IMF, which is something they're entitled to as a member, a $5 billion loan as assistance to deal with the COVID situation. And the Trump administration basically blocked that loan from going from IMF to Iran. That's something the Biden administration can uh, basically unblock or get out of the way for the IMF to be able to, um, to extend this loan, this assistance to Iran. And um, I think one good solution, because there's always this uh, concern about, are, is this money going to end up in Iran? Is it going to end up with the health workers? Is it going to end up uh, going into Iran's regional activities. There was a suggestion from, from a top Iranian official that the money can be paid into INSTEX, the financial mechanism I mentioned earlier, which is through Europe. So in that case, the Europeans will have full monitoring and control of how this uh, $5 billion loan is spent and to ensure that it's going to COVID-related um, relief and, and equipment. So I think that could also be a first initial step to get to kickstart. And then just uh, to end on a more hopeful note, we just heard of Robert Malley being assigned as the Iran envoy for the Biden uh, administration. We also know uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and Wendy Sherman, uh, Ambassador Sherman, are going to be in, in, in the room, and as well as John Kerry, who has an environmental uh, position, but he was basically the person in charge with the nuclear negotiations. So this, there's a team that was present when negotiations were happening with Iran. So this, this team has the expertise and the experience, the knowledge, and also the connections needed to make diplomacy happen. So I'm hopeful that it's a very capable team and that uh, they can pursue diplomacy, initially return back to the nuclear deal and then follow on with um, other issues that are of concern both to the US and US allies in the region and also the Europeans. Uh, there's a lot of regional tensions that Iran is involved. Some US allies are concerned about that. Um, and there's also the issue of human rights inside Iran. Finally, I wanna wrap by uh, saying that there are a number of dual nationals, including some Americans or Iranian Americans currently uh, in prison in Iran. I think that's something that the Biden administration should also prioritize in either through prisoner exchanges or any kind of negotiations to make sure that these uh, prisoners are can, can go back home. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to Ambassador Freeman. You're on mute. Chaz, you have to unmute. I've just done so. Um, I follow instructions. <laughs> oh, 
Um, I'm a bit of an afterthought on this uh, panel because the original panelist has been hauled off into the Biden administration um, and disappeared from public life, therefore. Um, so um, uh, I'm, I was very pleased to listen to the previous two uh, panelists. Uh, Jeff, uh, I thought, laid out very well the, uh, some of the perils now unfolding in the Horn of Africa. Um, reminded us of the mess that we helped create in Libya, which continues, um, and where we bear a certain degree of responsibility and have leverage we've not been using effectively. And also talked about Syria, uh, where I think also we bear a good deal of responsibility for the course of events. And Negar Mortasavi, I'm sorry, I don't speak Persian, so I, I'm not sure where the stress falls. Um, but uh, Negra basically uh, gave us a really good rundown on the tactical issues confronting the Biden administration uh, and the Iranian government and the ways in which we could signal um, a, a some sort of um, uh, approach to restarting uh, the kind of dialogue we had before. Uh, and I think it's noteworthy that the Biden administration is essentially a restorationist administration. Um, the people who are coming into government know how to run the government, uh, which was something that uh, the Trump administration never really figured out. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, the bad news or the question is whether all the experience they have may not blind them to the need for entirely new ideas and rethinking various problems. The world has changed uh, since they were last in office. Uh, the transatlantic relationship is deeply troubled. Uh, Brexit has occurred. There's no longer a British voice in the EU. Uh, there is a split between the United States and China, which is, among other things, creating dif different technological ecos ecospheres, ecosystems, um, and dividing the world in fundamental ways. Uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative is connecting Asia to Africa Europe and the Middle East in novel ways. Uh, the Trump administration, NECAP, the World Trade Organization, the WTO, is essentially sidelined and there are no rules that are now being enforced in the trade area. Uh, the US is pretty isolated at the UN, especially on Middle East issues, where there's almost no sympathy for the positions we've, we've taken. Uh, and uh, some of the issues that uh, Nagar mentioned affecting Iran, have also affected uh, confidence in the US dollar. So many countries deeply resent the use of dollar sovereignty to impose American regulation on their banks and um, impose American policies on their governments. It's also true that the US has changed. We've just exited the most bizarre presidency in our history. Uh, it was not going too far to say that the American people are not only polarized, but demoralized. We don't have a great deal of confidence. We are divided. Half of the public doesn't regard our, or perhaps a third, somewhere between a third and a half of our public doesn't accept the legitimacy of the Biden administration. And we've lost a lot of moral standing in the world. We can no longer expect others automatically to fall in behind us as they once did. Uh, our handling of the COVID pandemic has gained us a reputation for incompetence, which is the opposite of our previous uh, reputation. Our selfishness under America First policies uh, has eroded our reputation for generosity. So when you talk about providing assistance through the IMF or otherwise, uh, you run into an immediate uh, problem. Um, we have a reputation for being unreliable and erratic and countries wanting to work with us must consider the, the possibility that in 2024, we will again zig or zag off in an entirely different direction. And everybody is hedging on their relationship with the United States. So against this background, um, I think um, we need to recognize that there are quite a number of problems that the incoming group helped to create or which they failed to solve when they were in office. Uh, the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, which Jeff mentioned, 
uh, and elsewhere, uh, the expansion of counterterrorist activities to some 80 countries. Um, the misery in Gaza, which was mentioned earlier, and some of you have personal experience with it, uh, continues. Um, and whatever happens to the JCPOA, Iran is visibly less risk averse. It's willing to take risks with ships in the Strait of Hormuz and in the Levant. And in some ways, it's got the drop on Israel through its proxies um, in Syria and uh, Lebanon, which, as Jeff indicated, is in grave risk of uh, falling to pieces. Uh, in the middle of all this, uh, confidence in, in the US Navy's traditional role in preserving freedom of navigation in the Persian Gulf is in question, in doubt. Uh, instead of responding as we did in the past when Iran um, took a, a ship or two captive, uh, uh, we tried to organize a multinational task force and basically came up with very few participants. It's reassuring that the Albanian Navy is part of our coalition, I guess. Um, the um, Israel-Palestine issue is, if anything, worse than it was. And I note that UNRWA, the uh, international mechanism for supporting the Palestinian refugee populations in places like Lebanon and Syria and elsewhere, um, has uh, been defunded by the United States. There's a real question about what Palestinians who have been on that international dole will now do. And there is a possibility not to be ignored that what they do may uh, be, uh, uh, may enable them to be recruited for violence as mercenaries elsewhere. Um, Israeli annexation of the uh, pop of the pal Palestinian populated areas of Palestine still continues. Uh, the Abraham Accords, I think, are pretty unstable. Not only do we not know whether the United States is, as Gina, I think, referred to in the opening, her opening remarks, going to deliver the bribes that we offered uh, in the form of $23 billion worth of armament sales to the UAE and uh, sovereignty in Western Sahara for Morocco and uh, various goodies for others uh, in Bahrain and uh, uh, and <clears throat> and in uh, uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, whether whether we're going to come through is in doubt. All of these commitments are now up for review in an atmosphere in which the enemies of those commitments uh, are actively trying to undermine them. Um, so uh, there's also the issue that the normalization, or the, I should say the visible, uh, the, 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 the uncovering of what had previously been covert relationships of cooperation between Israel and um, various Arab intelligence services and the transformation into diplomatic relations is deeply opposed. Every poll in the Arab world and every poll shows that it lacks popular support. There is popular outrage as the elites practice real politique. How stable is that? Um, and I finally, I just note, uh, despite the labels that are put on these things, that none of the countries that uh, have now normalized with Israel were ever at war with Israel. So it's a little far-fetched to call these uh, peace agreements. The core issue of Palestine remains two-state solution is off the table for most purposes, although it remains a helpful incantation. Um, Israeli apartheid has deeply disturbed uh, Jews abroad uh, who don't want to be associated with that kind of uh, overt discrimination. Um, the recent Israeli vaccination program, which omitted Palestinians, just drove home the inhumanity of this situation and underscored that Zionism is not the same as Judaism. Judaism has universal values which Zionism ignores. And finally, the Israelis, uh, because they are dependent on uh, real politic arrangements with elites, um, have tended in their relationships in the region to 
reinforce authoritarianism. This is particularly the case in Egypt, uh, but one could find other examples where is Israel, which is a vigorous, robust democracy for Jews and a tyranny for Arabs, uh, reinforces authoritarianism among its neighbors. The Gulf Cooperation Council, which um, you know never amounted to a great deal, um, uh, if we're honest, um, is uh, a bit like Humpty Dumpty. It's fallen off the wall. Not clear that it can really be put back together. I note that the famous reconciliation between the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the um, and and Qatar. Uh, has been followed by what appears to be a Qatari campaign to replace Saudi Arabia as the principal American ally in the Gulf. Um, so clearly, um, uh, this sort of reconciliation is a bit superficial. Um, and I also note, and I think Jeff referred to this, uh, uh, that the various countries in the Gulf are all engaged in power projection uh, through the Red Sea and into the Horn of Africa, as is Turkey. Uh, so, um, uh, of course, the arrival of the Biden administration has alarmed people in Riyadh sufficiently uh, over the prospect of a breakdown in relations to cause uh, the Saudis to uh, make up with the Turks to some extent. That's part of the background to the Saudi Qatari uh, reconciliation. Um, and um, but Saudi Arabia has changed fundamentally in the last four years. Um, it's gone from consultative government by Shura uh, to one man rule, basically. Um, its de facto ruler, the crown prince Mohammed bin Salman, is persona non grata in the West, although welcome in Moscow, Beijing, and elsewhere. Um, the um, Reconsideration of arms sales, we've just held up a $500 million or so Raytheon uh, package uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and clearly there's tremendous opposition in the Congress uh, to continued um, arms sales to Saudi Arabia. This raises serious questions, uh, which I recall from my time, both as ambassador to Saudi Arabia and as assistant secretary of defense about the, our ability to preserve, preserve defense production lines. These depend on exports, and the largest exports are to the Gulf. And now uh, many, many sales to the Gulf are in doubt. Uh, Saudi Arabia's connections with us and others in the West are meanwhile eroding. Saudiization began with uh, the replacement of Westerners by people from the South Asian subcontinent. It's now uh, proceeding further. Uh, to the elimination of many expatriates in, in, the, in the kingdom. And I note also that new players in the region, uh, Russia, which now has a cooperative relationship with Saudi Arabia in support of OPEC, uh, something unprecedented, and China, which is the dominant trading partner of most countries in the region, um, uh, both available to replace any American uh, withdrawal of arms sales or anything else. Um, so uh, I mentioned that Saudi Arabia had patched it up with uh, Turkey, but Turkey is not the Turkey that it was four or five years ago. Um, it's now a regional power, very closely identified with the Middle East rather than Europe. It has a different relationship with Russia and with Iran. It has a base in Qatar. It has bases in the Red Sea and the Horn. It is an active supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is anathema to the authoritarian regimes in the Gulf because it stands for a sort of Islamist democracy, even if it proved utterly incompetent when it took power in Egypt and was overthrown. Um, and of course, uh, Saudi Arabia is also engaged in a vicious war in Yemen, which has brought Yemen to the point where it rivals Gaza as a center of misery. Um, I don't think the Congress, which once, which is twice voted against that war, uh, is going to allow it to continue, but no one in that war seems to be willing to admit defeat, which is the essential realization that leads you to make peace. And this is, of course, also bound up with the continuing rivalry between the Gulf Arab, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and, uh, 
in Iran, uh, to which no one has proposed a solution. So uh, uh, I think uh, I think Negra covered the JCPOA very well. So I won't say much about that. But I think you know her remarks illustrate the fact that this is not going to be easy to restore. Um, and especially it's not going to be easy to restore if all of those people who are out there arguing for the inclusion of all sorts of new issues that weren't included in the original nuclear package are now uh, have to be addressed. Missiles, Iranian influence, and Iranian uh, relationships with uh, Hezbollah or with, um, or, or with uh, militias in Iraq or whatever. Um, there are quite a number of proposals out there. And meanwhile, as we prepare to re-enter the JCPOA, Israel is threatening to attack Iran if that happens. Uh, the chief of staff of the IDF the other day was quite uh, open about that to the point where he's received criticism by other Israelis. Um, so um, the final point on Iran, I think I mentioned, but I think it reserves uh, attention and that is Middle East issues have helped isolate us at the UN. Uh, the use of the dollar as a mechanism for supporting unilateral sanctions has greatly undermined its future internationally. We are now seeing many countries experiment, begin to experiment with digital currencies, which would make a much easier trade settlement mechanism potentially than going through the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and subjecting yourself to American uh, ju jurisdiction. Uh, all in all, uh, we're talking about Middle East, of course. Um, it's, it needs to be noted that the United States, not Saudi Arabia, is now the swing producer for oil and to some extent for gas. And this means there's less American strategic interest in the Middle East. How far that trend is going to go, I don't know. But I think it was reflected in the naval uh, 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 default that uh, we saw, naval protection default that we saw in the Strait of Hormuz. I mentioned the alienation of many Jews in America and Europe with Israeli policies uh, toward the Palestinians. Um, I think that also undermines attention to the Middle East. Uh, and finally, the architects of the ill-fated pivot to Asia, which I call the pirouette to Asia because it didn't last very long um, and was never resourced, uh, are back in power. And all of the attention is supposed to be shifting uh, to uh, confrontation with China uh, in the newly renamed Indo-Pacific region. This too threatens American attention to the Middle East. If we do get into a war with, in the Middle East, which is not impossible since we've managed to do it on previous occasions, we also confront a new reality in terms of military technology. The Turkish drones that were used by Azerbaijan against Armenia demonstrated how effective a cheap locally produced weapon system can be at destroying the conventional weapons that we have all relied upon. Iran is quite competent at drone production. And we've seen the use of drones of Iranian design, at least, against the facilities of Saudi Aramco with pinpoint precision. So the, the, the envir military environment is also changing. I think any one of these issues that I've mentioned, and I'm sure I haven't covered all of the potential issues, would be daunting. And when the Biden administration is faced with dealing with all of them at once. So I think we need to be charitable and give it a bit of a break as it starts off. It's not off to a bad start, but it's going to need a lot of help uh, to get through what faces it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Congressman Moran, you're waving your hand. Did you want to say something? Yes, if you don't mind, Ambassador, uh, I would like to give uh, a little bit of, of an overview, uh, given the fact that this is a congressional conference. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks relatively pithy, but um, 
they and 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 not uh, repeat what has already been said by uh, some uh, tremendous uh, experts. The depth and breadth of this panel is is marvelous, Ambassador. So, uh, first of all, uh, we are all aware that uh, we are witnessing a a, a, a profound pivot uh, in terms of foreign policy. Uh, where there are two ends of the spectrum. Uh, on the, um, the previous administration, it, it was uh, bilateral uh, personal transactionalism, if you will, uh, almost uh, unprecedented. Uh, what the Biden administration brings is predictable professionalism. Uh, that should appeal to the people that I see uh, uh, participating in this because I would consider all of you part of that camp. We need to be pre predictable as a nation. Uh, we need to have a, uh, a policy that is uh, uh, understandable and, and uh, that is carried out uh, in a consistent manner. Uh, uh, granted, the administration has said that they want to focus primarily on Asia. I think that gives more leverage to deal uh, with the Middle East. I should say, and I'm confident of this because I know some of them, to put Rob Valley as the envoy to uh, Iran, uh, have Wendy Sherman at the table, to have John Kerry at the table, I can guarantee you they are not going to let the JCPOA become a footnote to history. They are going to revisit. Now, now as foreign, uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Shavad Zarif said, uh, the JCPOA is meant to be a foundation, not Congressman Moran, we're um, having some slight issues with your um, video and audio quality. Are you um, still there, Congressman? All right, I think I'm back on. I'm sorry, thank you, Professor Feldman. So I, I'm here, can you hear me now? We do hear can you, you hear again. Me? You may want to um, turn off your video. I'm here. Uh, if you turn off can, your video you and just keep the audio, it might um, improve the quality. Okay. Turn off the video? Yeah, just turn right. off the video and keep the audio on and, and we can hear the audio fine. I'll do that. I will do that. So I'll keep, uh, I'll keep talking. Uh, it says, uh, well, I, I just, all right. I turned it off. I don't know. It keeps putting. I, I will try to it sounds much uh, continue better. talking. Yeah, it sounds great. Thank you. Oh, dear. I, and I would note, um, I, Jim Moran apparently is having real trouble. Um, he, when he was a member of Congress, he was one of the very few members who would come to a Middle East Policy Council meeting, listen and make intelligent comments and ask questions. Um, and I think it's wonderful that he's on the Middle East Policy Council board now. And uh, I wish he were, I wish we could hear what he was saying because I don't yeah, Thank that. you. Thank you. Back. Well, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. I'll try. This is an incentive to give me some sign when you can't hear me. Okay. So, just saying that the JCPOA to history. I uh, uh, I'm confident of that. Now, one of the things. Can you hear me, Gina? Just give me the uh, if you can hear me. Uh, uh, shall I keep talking? This is so, uh, I'm so, this isn't working. Uh, 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 Jim, Nick, we can hear you, Jim, we can hear you, but you can't see us, I think that's the problem, but Gina's giving you the high sign. Oh, okay. You know, you certainly don't need to see me. Uh, okay, at my age, you certainly don't need to, uh, to see me in the <laughs> library behind me. So let me continue in terms of the administration. 
uh, in the Congress, you are going to have uh, a, a uh, relationship in many areas. For example, what I would turn the humanitarian, can you hear me, Gina? Yes, the, I can hear you. The humanitarian caucus, if you will, uh, is back, okay, is back in charge. And there are some fundamental differences with the Congress uh, that we are dealing, we will be dealing with. Uh, Greg Meeks taking over from Elliot Engel as chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee uh, is important. Uh, Rosa DeLauro taking over uh, the uh, chair of Appropriate Lowy uh, is more important than people realize. Barbara Lee taking over Foreign Operations Appropriations. Those will all uh, eventually show that uh, there are some fundamental shifts in terms of our policy. Tom Malinowski will be the vice chair of the Foreign Committee. Uh, Tom was pr previously served in the Obama administration. His emphasis is democracy and human rights. On the Senate side, uh, you're going to see a, a group of what I, again, uh, would be considered a humanitarian caucus that sees, will see more in line with the administration and with the House. Uh, if Chris Murphy becomes the chair committee of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, that will have a profound difference. Uh, he is very close to Chris Van Hollen. I think we know where Senator Van Hollen stands on the Middle East. He's very progressive on these uh, issues. Uh, they will tie in with Tim Kaine, uh, another member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So I think you're going to see a, a major emphasis on democracy and human rights, and that's going to have consequences in the Middle East. For example, the Israeli issue, uh, uh, they are going to go back to a two-state solution or at least something better uh, than what we have now with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian relationship, uh, which is really only held together because Qatar is providing billions of dollars in economic aid to the uh, people in Gaza and will probably wind up uh, continuing to provide aid uh, to the uh, West Bank as, as well. Uh, the United States will restore uh, UNRWA funding and uh, U.S. foreign aid to Palestine. Uh, the fact that Bibi Netanyahu and, um, uh, uh, and MBZ and MBS uh, appeared to do everything they could to have uh, uh, President uh, Trump reelected uh, is not lost on the foreign policy team of the administration. Uh, and uh, and so I think you're going to see some uh, a, 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 um, a playing out of the fact that President Biden said that uh, MBZ should be con uh, Mohammed bin Zalman of Saudi Arabia should be treated be treated as a pariah. Uh, I think you're going to see UAE have some problems. Uh, you've already seen that the sale of F-35s uh, has been halted. Uh, they are in clear violation of the Caesar Act with regard to Syria. Uh, they, uh, their intervention on behalf of General Hifter in uh, Libya, even though there is a static state right now, uh, it's, it's still uh, one of tension. And, uh, and I think that, uh, the, that uh, uh, MBZ is going to have to pull back uh, uh, military support for people like General Hifter to, to uh, pull back their normalization with uh, President Assad until there is some uh, firmed up policy with regard to Syria. So uh, uh, some of, of this uh, uh, getting involved in, uh, in suppressing the democratization effort uh, that came as a, a, a result of the uh, Arab Spring, uh, I think you're going to see many of people in the both the Congress and the uh, Biden administration returning to some of that vision because you've got too many young people, they're too well-educated and they're too suppressed for this to be a sustainable situation. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think we're going to see a lot of change in the Middle East, notwithstanding talk about a pivot uh, to Asia. And from my, and from my perspective, uh, I think it's a positive change. Uh, I, I hate to speak so fast, and I can't be sure whether you can even hear me, uh, but I thank you for giving me the time. It's more time than I'm, I deserved, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, again, this is a, a excellent panel, 
and uh, and terrific participation looking at the names on my uh, on my screen here so thank you all very much well, thank you so much, Congressman. Uh, excellent addition. And we've had a wonderful array of uh, ideas put forward, pivot or pirouette. I'm holding on to that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Basma al Gusain to start moderating the questions. I will remind you all that if you have questions for the panel, please email them to nepc.press at gmail.com. And with that, Basma. Hello everyone, thank you so much for those incredible remarks. I am going to actually open with a question that came through our info at mepc.org email. Um, and I think actually all of the speakers can uh, take a few minutes to touch on this. So the question has three parts. Uh, it is, what do you expect the new administration to do in Iraq? If there is a new deal with Iran, Iran will obviously still wish to maintain dominance there. Do you think that Biden should pull out or ramp up troops in Iraq? And then regarding the embassy, should we increase personnel at the now depleted embassy, leave it as it is, or close it as Pompeo threatened to do due to the security environment? Nagar, would you like to maybe start? And then I'd actually, I'm, I'm curious to hear everybody's thoughts on that since it's such a broad question. Sure, let me just uh, give a viewpoint from the, basically the Iranian perspective and then the other panels maybe can talk about what they think the US should do. What we have to understand is uh, Iran-Iraq relationship goes back in the Iranian psyche to the 1980s, the eight year war with Saddam between Iran and Iraq. They're the two countries, the neighbors, they share a long border. There's a lot of exchange and cultural ties. And that war was basically very devastating. It was a very uh, deadly war, it took eight years. And it's something that when you look at the security concerns and the um, basically the, the strategy that Iran has in the region, Iraq, it plays a very central role because it's Iran's immediate in, immediate neighbor and because of that eight year war and uh, an experience that basically not, not the government and also no Iranian want to see repeated. So I think Iranian influence in Iraq is something that's of very much importance to Iran. And also as we saw, um, after the invasion of Iraq, after the US invasion of Iraq and the um, emergence of ISIS and all of these other problems across Iran's borders, Iran's influence became even more integral. It's not something that the Iranians are going to um, stop. It's not a region that Iranians are going to stop caring about or to leave or reduce influence. But I think what we saw from the Trump administration and the policy of that administration was just an increasing intentions, um, more, creating more security uh, problems for, for American troops and also both sides, Iran and the U.S., turning Iraq into a battlefield for sort of a proxy war. We saw the assassination of Qasem Soleimani happening at the Baghdad International Airport. And we even saw Iraqi officials basically pleading for the both sides uh, to stop using their, their country as a battlefield. And then we saw Iranians retaliating for the killing or the assassination of Qasem Soleimani into an Iraqi base, shooting missiles at where US forces were based, but it was also on Iraqi soil. So, um, I think the Biden administration should look for a more creative solution on how to deal with this issue. I'll leave it to other panelists to talk more to that, but it's definitely not an, a country or an area that Iran is going to stop caring about or try to reduce influence specifically because it's, it's their immediate um, neighbor. So um, perhaps I'll make a comment. Um, um, first, um, the uh, American embassy in Baghdad uh, resembles nothing so much as a crusader castle, um, a legacy of a failed intervention that is vastly in excess of any normal diplomatic requirement. In diplomacy, it is the responsibility of the host government to protect envoys 
from other countries. If the Iraqi government cannot do that, uh, then uh, I don't think the embassy should stay. Uh, but in any event, it needs to be radically downsized from something that looks very much like an outpost for imperial administration of Iraq to something more normal and commensurate with the scale of our actual interests in Iraq. Um, I think what is preventing that is a combination of factors, which we also see in effect in Afghanistan and to some extent in Syria. Uh, in Afghanistan, our principal objective seems to be to avoid admitting defeat as we leave. Um, and uh, the fact that Iraq has, has gone extremely wrong from our point of view uh, in terms of intervention, um, you know, invites a rethinking of, 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 of that, that relationship. I know that the Iraqi government on several occasions has asked us to leave and we have declined. I don't think that is an appropriate response to the request of the Iraqis. They have to live with their own problems. If we are helpful to them in solving those problems or managing them, uh, then they will want us around and we should try to be helpful. Um, but if they want us gone and are willing to take on those problems themselves, let them do it. Um, and in that connection, finally, on the Iraqi-Iranian relationship, um, Iraq is a proud, independent country. Uh, during the eight years of the war that uh, Anekar mentioned with Iran, Iranians, uh, ex excuse me, Iraqis showed that they were first Iraqis, then Arabs, and last of all, Shia. Um, so uh, I think the extent to which the United States continuing presence over very considerable opposition in Iraq diverts Iraqi nationalism from independence from Iran is not, is not an advantage for the United States. Uh, we'd probably be better off if we weren't so uh, visibly uh, present. Um, but this is a very complex issue and nobody should rush into, into a resolution of it on the, on the fly. Uh, it's, it's something the administration, the new administration is going to have to look at. But I, I would encourage them to look at it from the point of view of how to bolster Iraqi nationalism within Iraqi independence and how to respect Iraq diplomatically um, and step away from the fallacy of sunk costs in addressing our relationship with that country. Uh, Mr. Feldman or Mr. Moran, would you like to speak to this, Mr. Moran? Last time I'm going to speak, I, I will, uh, I've got to go to another function, but I can tell you what I think the administration and Congress should do and, and what I hope they will do. First of all, uh, 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 relieving Iran of the current sanctions is a sine qua non. They're going to have to engage in diplomacy with Iran so that Iran will play a helpful and not a hurtful role in terms of Iraq's future. Uh, Chas couldn't be more correct that uh, Iraqis are, uh, many are nationalists more than they are even sectarians. Uh, but um, nevertheless, uh, Iran has to play a, a major role in this as does Saudi Arabia and uh, the rest of Iraq's neighbors. Uh, Saudi Arabia needs to get out of the doghouse with the United States. This is one of the ways to begin that process to play a constructive role in Iraq, as Iran needs to. Uh, there's no question but that there will not be military intervention of any nature by the United States in Iraq again, probably never again. Uh, but nevertheless, we can't ignore it. Uh, that we, we have to play a role. And as they say, you know, if you break it, you really ought to try to help uh, fix it. And, and uh, so I think we do have some concomitant responsibility. I do think that's what Congress uh, is going to want to do to uh, work on uh, Iraq through its neighbors uh, so that um, it, it will spell out the kind of diplomatic approach 
approach rather than militaristic approach that the Biden administration and leadership in the Congress is going to want to implement, implement in many ways. And they could uh, certainly start with the rest. And it's very nice to be with you and I hope you have a great day. Thank you all very much. I learned a lot, thank you. Bye, Mr. Moran. Thank you so much for participating and fitting us into your busy morning. Um, Ambassador Feltman, um, would you like to speak to this? Sure, I'll be brief since we've, since we've spoken a lot on this, on this um, first series of questions. Um, and I certainly agree with, with um, Ambassador Freeman that, that that embassy is a symbol of, of the type of relationship that we don't want with Iraq. I mean, I remember going there visiting as Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs quite frequently, particularly during the 2010 government formation period. And it felt like a com that embassy compound felt like a combination of a community college and a high security prison. It's not, an, it's not a normal embassy. Um, at the same time, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we have interests in Iraq? I would argue that yes, we have interests in Iraq. Um, so as difficult as the environment may be in terms of politics, security, et cetera, as long as the Iraqis aren't physically kicking us out, I mean, I mean there's, a, there's a lot of lip service at times, particularly after the Soleimani assassination to, throw, to throwing us out, but I don't think that that's, there's ever been an official decision to do that because there are constituencies in Iraq that want us there. We need to stay and compete. We need to find ways to maintain a presence on the ground. That's appropriate. Um, and not cede the territory to, you know, Iran. Um, we, it's, a, it's similar to what I talked about with Lebanon. No matter how difficult the, the environment, if we have interest somewhere, it's in, um, we should be staying there and finding creative and appropriate ways to defend and promote those interests um, and not allow, not create a vacuum by our departure that others, that others will fill. I couldn't agree more with that. With that. Um, we need to compete. We need to be prepared to take risks in our diplomacy. Uh, and we need to support our interests. And we do have interests in Iraq, which we have not effectively defended in many respects. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, this first question is pointed to Nagar, um, but it is a several part question, which I then would like the entire panel to speak to. So um, Nagar, you mentioned that the Iranian presiden presidential election will take place in June and that we will have a new president, or rather Iran will have a new president in August. Can you speak a little bit to who the candidates are running for president? And is there one who appears to be more open to diplomacy with the US versus another? How closely should we, we, we be watching this? Sure. So we actually won't know the exact candidates until sometime next month. But what Iranian presidential elections are very different from the U.S. as in everything happens in the final three weeks, I would say. Like the current president, Hassan Rouhani, was very down in polls until the very final um, live televised debate when he started to pull up. So the but what we've seen, what I can speak to is that the the overall political direction of the country has been going towards a more hardline um, and anti-US uh, stance. We saw that last year in the parliamentary elections when the hardliners took over somewhat by the votes, there was also very low participation because there's Iran is also dealing with a lot of uh, domestic crises. There's the economic situation, which is a byproduct of US sanctions. There's also a lot of government corruption and that has made the population very angry. Iran has seen a lot of massive anti-government protests in the past few years, including one past November, November 2019, which was um, became a very bloody protest. It was repressed completely, cracked down by the state. Security forces killed a few hundred people on the street. So these are the crises that the uh, that the state is dealing with internally while also dealing with the pressure from the outside and the paranoia combined with that uh, pressure and security concern. So I've seen the political direction going more uh, towards a hardline stance as, as one byproduct of the Trump administration's maximum pressure, but 
that could also change again in the final weeks if diplomacy restarts with the United States and if a return to the JCPOA means lifting of sanctions and if the Iranian economy sees a boost from the easing of sanctions, if the average Iranian starts seeing some result of that economic boost, or at least a hope, a prospect for, for a better economy, that could change the dynamics and then eventually help the moderate slash reformists to regroup and have a strong candidate and potentially win the presidency, which would be beneficial to the Biden team because they would be dealing with someone who's from the pro-diplomacy camp. But if the hardliners continue as the political landscape is right now, then that means that the Biden administration would be dealing for the rest of President Biden's presidency and potentially a second term with a hardline president in Iran who's now combined with a hardline parliament. So it's a very critical um, election. Period. I understand. Um, so with that, I, actually, I have a question for our diplomats on the panel. Clearly, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to negotiate a new Iran deal in the form of a treaty with such a slim majority in the Senate. So how is our credibility affected, obviously, by Trump's actions to just simply be able to pull out? Is there any other diplomatic or executive technique or strategy that we could that the Biden administration could use to pursue a new Iran deal, new J JCPOA that would have more staying power in the event that um, another Republican comes into office and wants to dismantle it? And how, how will that impact our credibility in the next six months with negotiating with the Iranians? Jeff, you want to go first or shall I? Go ahead, Chaz. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay, so um, I think you've uh, this question. I don't know who asked it, but uh, it's really fundamental. Um, and I'm sorry, Jim Moran is not uh, still with us uh, because the American Constitution is revolutionary in many respects. Um, but one of them is that it assigns the war power to the Congress, unquestionably. The executive does not have the authority to declare war, to initiate war. It has the authority, the president is the commander in chief and he can respond to an attack, but then has to go to Congress for authority as FDR did after Pearl Harbor. Um, and the role of the Congress is underscored by this power, which the Congress has frivolously, I think, given away. It doesn't enforce it. Uh, if you have an executive agreement, as we have seen, uh, it can immediately be undone by uh, a new, new president. Uh, in fact, the first eight days of the Biden administration have been an exercise in uh, bombardment with executive orders, undoing the executive orders of his predecessor, both domestic and and foreign, uh, case in point, the Paris Accords on Climate Change. So having a treaty which is approved by the ratification of which is approved by the Senate uh, is very, very important. And we've gotten away from that. It is actually the last treaty that the, that the Congress approved was I think in 2008. We're not, we don't do treaties anymore because we're too divided. So this is a, care, a place where domestic uh, polarization and gridlock and foreign policy intersect. And I think, um, you know, there's no easy answer to this. It is the perfect illustration of why we have to get our act together domestically if we're going to have an effective foreign policy. Um, in the meantime, I guess we stumble on with executive agreements, which have no legally binding effect um, under, under our constitution. Um, let, let me add, because I certainly agree with everything Ambassador, Ambassador Freeman said. Um, the, the question is, a very, is, is an extremely important one, and I'm going to bring in a, another place, piece of security issue, very far, far, far away to illustrate this. 
Um, some of you may be aware that when I was still an Undersecretary General for Political Affairs at the United Nations, I was doing some diplomacy to try to, re to, try to de-escalate tensions with North Korea. This was, in, this was in, in late 2017 when it looked as though Washington and Pyongyang were on a trajectory toward war. And I took a, and I took a trip out to, to Pyongyang at the invitation of the, of the DPRK government um, and engaged with some follow-up diplomacy later. Um, one of the questions that came to me, uh, 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 a DPRK diplomat asked to meet me in Oslo a few months later. And the question that he was trying to explore was, Given that the, at the time there had been a Singapore declaration between Kim Jong Un, the DPRK leader, and and President Donald Trump, and it looked as though that there was going to be movement toward um, some kind of negotiation negotiation process between the United States and the DPRK, what did I recommend as a UN official and former U.S. official of how to make sure that any agreement reached would not suffer the fate of the JCPOA? So even our DPRK adversary, believing at the time that they were moving towards some sort of negotiation, negotiation process with us, were worried by the fate of the JCPOA about what would happen if, if, any, if there was any breakthrough. Obviously there wasn't any breakthrough, so the question became moot, but it shows, it underscores the, the importance of this credibility question that has been raised. Second thing, well, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of the, JC, of, the JC, of the JCPOA. I think it was, it was accomplishing what it was intended to accomplish. And I regret very much the Trump administration's decision to withdraw the U.S. But I will offer a criticism of the Obama administration in, in how it presented this. There were, there were almost two arguments. As, as Congressman Moran wisely said, wisely quoted Javad Zarif, that this was not the... This was not the um, this was this. There were there were. Uh, let me start over. I'm sorry. Oh. Um, the administration, in sometimes said the JCPOA is about the nuclear program. It's about our concerns on the nuclear program. Full stop. Other times, the administration would imply this is opening the door to all sorts of positive things between us and Iran. This is going to change the entire equation between us and the, and the Iranians. And at the same time, the Iranians were basically seizing American hostages, you know, in terms of dual nationals, they were continuing um, what we would see as misbehavior in the region, pursuing what they would see as their interests, what we would see as misbehavior, that this, that this agreement was a narrowly focused agreement. And I think that would have, they would have had more success in building understanding and support had they stuck to the talking points that there is a nuclear problem with Iran, and this is the agreement that addresses our nuclear concerns. Now we have other issues and we need to try to address those other issues, but instead it became a mixed message. It looked like they were overselling at some points the Iran deal. I think that that, under, that undercut any sort of popular support legitimacy it might've had here because people saw that it wasn't doing um, everything that it said that sometimes they said to do. Um, the, the third thing that I would that I would um, notice, I would note, is that um, I don't think Iran would necessarily reject pursuing an exec an agreement that goes under executive order again. Even though even though we all saw what happened when Trump pulled out, that Trump had the ability to pull out since it wasn't a treaty. I don't think Iran would necessarily. Um, avert its eyes if that was what was on the table again. But of course, I refer to, to greater expertise on this panel on this issue. Why? Because Iran, when Trump initially pulled out, the President Trump initially pulled out, was able to say, we're not the problem. They're the problem. And that served their public relations, their public diplomacy, diplomacy interests. So I wouldn't rule out Iran um, entering into something else with an, with an, with an executive, executive order um, given the fact that it could be a win-win for them. One, if the agreement sticks, they get to they they move forward in whatever the agreement says. Two, if it if if it falls apart because a different administration cancels it, then Iran says, see, we're not the problem. It's those guys over in over in in Washington that are the problem. I'll stop there. Excellent. Just a, yeah, we didn't nobody mentioned a very key point. And that is that we went to the UN Security Council, which approved the JCPOA and made it part of international law. And the Trump administration ignored that. 
Um, that is a, a clear violation of the UN Charter and international law. And I suppose we went to the Security Council. I wasn't part of the negotiations with Tehran, but I suppose we went there in part to reassure them on this very point, that while it was an executive agreement, it had the force of international law behind it. Now that is not enough under our constitution to make it inviolable apparently. Uh, but uh, I, I think Jeff is right. There's no reason the, the Iranians might, will not be willing under the right circumstances to continue to deal pragmatically with this issue. Uh, but their concern is on, on, on the question of, our, of the durability of any agreement and our fidelity to it uh, is not baseless. Let me, if I may, if I may follow up on, what, on, on Chaz's wise, wise words. I was under Secretary General for Political Affairs at the UN when the, when the JCPOA was codified um, by the Security Council. Um, and of course, it still exists in the Security Council. It still is part of international law. It's still there. The US and Iran are both violating it, but it still does exist under international law. But one of the responsibilities that, that my staff, that my staff and I had was to uh, prepare the biennial reports required under the Security Council resolution that, that um, codified the JCPO in international law on, on what were called restrictive measures. What, what Iran was required to do or, or prohibited from doing, I should say, under the, under the JCPOA. Basically sanctions were lifted, but certain, certain restrictive measures were remained in place. And trying to do that report every six months was one of the more difficult things we had to do because of the way that, some, that, that the um, JCPOA and the accompanying resolution was drafted. And it's a, it's a lesson for us. The, the question of ballistic missiles, the United States believed very strongly at the time, argued very strongly that ballistic missiles were included in the restrictive measures, that Iran could not develop ballistic missiles. The Russians and the Chinese would argue, would argue, no, they can't. Because what the, what, the, what the resolution says is that Iran is restricted from, from developing, I don't have the exact legal language in front of me, but from developing ballistic missiles um, designed to be capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And so the Russians and the Iranians said that word design means that unless the Iranians were explicitly designing missiles to carry nuclear weapons, it didn't apply. The Americans would say, no, no, it just means that any missile that's capable, any missile that, that, you, that you've developed that's capable of, being, of having a nuclear warhead added to it is, is thing. So in the, in the future, when they go back to the Security Council, some of these ambiguities need to be resolved um, in order to bring clarity to what's actually been agreed. Um, Ambassador, that is an excellent point and a great segue into my next question. As you know, one of the primary um, objections to the deal by our Gulf allies in Israel was the stance and the deal on uh, the Iranians capability to still hold um, ballistic missiles. And we've talked about the Abraham Accords. We've talked about how there's $23 billion in arms sales to the UAE that are pending congressional approval. Obviously, Jared Kushner you know, promised that we would recognize Moroccan sovereignty over Western Sahara. Um, as you pointed out, or I think as Ambassador Freeman pointed out, MBS is now persona non grata. Um, the blockade is against Qatar is over and Qatar wants to become, you know, a, a, a more of a player in the region and a close U.S. ally. My question is, do you think, you know, obviously if we want to preserve the Iran deal in the long term, we need to have the buy-in of the Gulf and at least not a strong lobby against it from the Israelis. So in exchange, do you think one possibility to accomplish that would be if the Biden administration went forward with the 
uh, Abraham Accord agreements, basically bribes, and said, but if we do this, i.e., if we sell 23 billion in arms to the UAE, i.e., you know, um, and everything else, um, you guys have to kind of lay off when it comes to the Iran deal. Do you think that's one method potentially of preserving the deal or moving forward? Or how are we going to how are we going to deal with the opposition from the Gulf allies and the Israelis? I mean, I think this is one of the implications of the of the Abraham Accords that we do need to think about. And thank you for raising this. Um, I mean, in general, the idea of of expanding this, the circle of, of countries that, that have peaceful relations and commercial relations, cultural relations in the Middle East, I think is, is something in general is positive. We can't, and none of us can, can oppose this. But think about the, the, the very strident Israeli and Gulf, particularly Emirati opposition to the JCPOA when the JCPOA was negotiated. Um, I think we all assume that there was probably some, some back room, some quiet under the table coordination between the Israelis and the Emiratis at the time for how they would approach Capitol Hill, how they would approach um, the, the public more generally in their opposition. But, it, it was, it, but there was no overt coordination. There was no overt solidarity between, between the UAE and, and Israel. Now there could be. You know, now if the Biden administration presents something that the Israelis and Emiratis and, and others would see as not in their interest, you could imagine a joint op-ed by Mohammed bin Zayed and Benjamin Netanyahu that would that would that would have a lot of influence. So there's so there's an aspect of the Abraham Accords that might lead to them bullying up again, you know, them bullying up together against us um, on on certain issues. How do you get around that? Well, I think that we have to acknowledge that the Gulf states do have real security concerns. Um, look at look at look at the Yemen war in Saudi Arabia. I think we're all appalled at how poorly the, the Saudi targeting has been, how poorly, the Saudi, how atrociously the Saudis have waged that war in terms of creating the biggest humanitarian crisis on, on earth. And it's largely from the airstrikes from Saudi Arabia that have done that. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia does have a security issue. Um, the, the, um, as we saw with Al Qaeda before, but as we've seen even seen more recently with um, explosions over, over Riyadh. Is there, and I'm not sure that even if, the, even if our pressure or our, our, even if we're able to convince the Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia to end its part of the Yemen war, the Yemen war itself was not going to end. The Yemen war is a very complicated thing between the Yemenis themselves. So how do we show the Saudis that we understand their security concerns without giving them a green light on continuing to wage the war as they have um, since 2015, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. But I believe, again, that we need to be honest with our Gulf friends and with Israel. There is a nuclear, we, there is a nuclear challenge that Iran poses. The JCPOA addresses that. So now let's talk together about how we address these other security challenges, rather than we don't have, to, it's not either or, we don't have to throw out the JCPOA or ignore the nuclear challenge in order to start addressing the other security challenges um, in 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 the region. We can do we can do both. Excellent. Um, so I want to go to another question from an audience member uh, that follows up with that. So the new administration will need new partners in the Middle East. What are the chances of the administration cultivating stronger relationships with leaders like King Abdullah of Jordan, President Saleh of Iraq, and overlooked regional leaders along with the EU and NATO? Well, the question I think um, goes to uh, how much clout uh, those leaders have. And I have to say that um, uh, their clout is extremely limited. Um, uh, Jordan is a buffer state created for that purpose. Um, it is torn internally between a huge Palestinian refugee population. It sits on the edge of the Palestinian volcano and it's very constrained in what it can do. It's dependent for financially dependent on Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries, as well as to some extent the United States, although very often uh, so-called American aid is actually in the past was actually Saudi or other Arab aid funneled through us. Um, Iraq is pretty isolated 
um, in part because of its uh, affiliation with Iran. Um, there are, the United States does need to find uh, and reinvigorate partnerships, but I think it's going to be quite difficult. Um, just to comment a little bit on earlier uh, things. First of all, US recognition of the Western Sahara as part of Morocco is also a violation of Security Council resolutions and another contemptuous dismissal of international law. Uh, so we've set a precedent there for Israeli an annexation of the West Bank um, without regard to international law. That makes this somewhat important. Uh, I don't know how the Biden administration plans to deal with this. Uh, but um, I note also that the UAE's uh, normalization with Israel was explicitly contingent on the suspension of annexation. Um, is that, in fact, a promise the Israelis made? I would suspect uh, that there's all sorts of fine print in whatever uh, commitment they may have made, if they made any. Um, on the issue of the UAE conspiring with the Israelis on Capitol Hill, uh, we've already seen an overt Saudi-Israeli effort, division of labor, in which the Israelis mobilized their domestic American supporters and the Saudis hired uh, a giant a group of public relations firms and lobbyists um, to work in, in, in effect in parallel, not together, uh, to the same end. So this is a real uh, issue. Uh, and finally, I just want to say on the issue of Yemen, where the Royal Saudi Air Force has become infamous for its uh, uh, inability to hit targets precisely from 15,000 feet, um, it's ironic that the, the Raytheon cell that we're now holding up was precision guided munitions, which enable the precise hitting of targets rather than um, the, and minimize collateral damage. Uh, these are all very complicated issues and they're not simple. And um, um, I think the Biden administration, frankly, has got more than enough to deal with domestically. And it's not going to be terribly focused at the outset on these questions. Excellent. Next question. What, do, what role does Israel play in destabilizing the Horn of Africa, if any, considering that they're seeking hegemony in the region and this geography has crucial geopolitical importance? Ambassador Feltman, would you like to take that? Well, I'll, I'll take it, but I, 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 um, those those that follow what I've what I've written in recent months will see that I I predicted a um, I predicted that the Sudan relationship with Israel would weaken and undermine the very delicate transition and civilian military relationship in Sudan, and that hasn't happened yet. So I I, I will take the question, but with all. But, but noting that my, that my sky is falling prediction at least has not yet come, come true. Um, I don't think that, that Israel has the same leverage that are in the, in the horn that our Gulf friends have, that Egypt has, that Turkey has, um, whatever, their, whatever the Israeli ambitions are. I think that, that, that the other countries are playing a much, much stronger role. And we see that in the, in the Turkish Emirati um, differences in Somalia, where, where Turkey, has, Turkey and Qatar have, have given strong support from Mogadishu, the central government, whereas the UAE has supported some of the federal states of, of Somalia against the UAE, against the strong government, against the government in Mogadishu, it's not a strong government. Um, you don't see the Israelis playing, playing that sort of game, whatever their, whatever their security relationships might be here and there. You don't see them as deeply engaged in the politics of the region to try to check their adversaries' policies in the region. So it's not, so I don't see the Israelis playing the same um, proxy games in the horn that some of, our other, uh, some of our other friends are playing, which is why I argued in my opening remarks that the, the most influential players in the horn today aren't necessarily the African leaders. They're the ones that are in the Arab world and, and Turkey, and that's why we need to engage them. I think that's right. 
Thank you. Ambassador Freeman, you mentioned in your remarks that China and Russia are both available to sell arms to our allies in the Middle East and to make up any cuts in aid. Given that reality, what is the main form of leverage we have in the region when it comes to countries uh, that we don't want to create a power vacuum for China and Russia to fill? This goes back to something that uh, Jeff Feldman said. Um, we have to recognize, for example, in Yemen, that there are real security interests at stake for Saudi Arabia. Um, in the past, Saudi Arabia dealt with these issues by what used to be called realpolitik, meaning the use of the real, the Saudi currency, uh, to rent uh, various tribal and uh, other factional groups in Yemen, you, you can always rent Yemenis, you can't buy them, I guess. But um, uh, anyway, um, I think we should be trying to push the Saudis and others back to that uh, time-honored practice, which is vastly preferable to uh, bombing, strafing, and, and generally um, hiring mercenaries and, 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 and shooting up things, uh, as well as starving people by closing down the logistics, uh, the, the support. Um, I think, Jeff, you didn't refer to the humanitarian industrial. Oh, it was Jim Moran who referred to the, what I call the humanitarian industrial complex, uh, which is very involved in, in, in Yemen. Uh, so um, I think um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the issues, um, again, need to be dealt with through engagement, not disengagement. Uh, as Jeff said, we need to be in the region. We need to be defending our interests. We need to be um, we need to be cognizant of, and to the extent we can be, supportive of our partners' interests, whoever they may be, Israel or Saudi Arabia or UAE. Um, and um, only when those interests directly conflict with ours uh, should we withhold uh, the sort of support that that a friendly relationship uh, requires. Now. Sometimes the best form of friendship you know, with any of the countries I mentioned is to um, quietly uh, inform them, help them understand that what they're doing is counterproductive. In the specific case of Yemen, I think the Saudis have basically decided they very much want out. And um, anything we could do to help that, help them achieve that on a non embarrassing, graceful basis would be very welcome and it would strengthen our relationship with a country that remains very important. Um, just to end, I think we need to recognize that countries like Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Egypt or other countries in that particular area of the Arabian Peninsula and around it uh, occupy a, a, a very important geopolitical position. You can't get between Europe and Asia except over them or through their seas. So. Um, they are one of the most important strategic lines of communication or blockages of it potentially that you could find. Um, this is the epicenter of Islam, one of the world's great religions, perhaps 2 billion in, um, adherents who look to Mecca uh, five times a day and, 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 and are responsive to spiritual guidance from people uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, this is uh, a huge uh, part of the world's uh, hydrocarbon supply and trade. It is a major market for many, many things. And China, Russia all understand this. Uh, I think we understand it too. Um, and so they are an alternative to us. Uh, and in some cases, maybe we should give them the opportunity. But um, I think we need to stay in there and compete with them, not default. The next qu question is the Biden administration is closer to the positions of other UN Security Council countries on a number of Middle Eastern issues than previous administrations. What is the potential for the Security Council to act in concert on issues in that region including on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, especially in light of the fact, Ambassador Freeman, you noted that there is less support among American Jews 
uh, for what can be called Israeli human rights violations in the region. I think Jeff. Oh, um, I think Jeff should take that question, uh, but I'll just say at the outset that um, uh, I think one of the things, one of the hard truths we have to recognize is that there is now one state in Palestine. There is control is centralized. That state has its capital in Jerusalem. And the issue at this point, since physically it's virtually impossible to separate Palestinians from Israelis, even without considering those Israelis who are Palestinian, um, the issue now is uh, whether the world is prepared to tolerate the disenfranchisement of about half the population of that region. Not just the disenfranchisement of them. You know, there are three categories below the citizens of Israel in terms of their rights. Arab citizens of Israel who are neglected and discriminated against. The inhabitants of the West Bank who have no rights and are subjected to Kafkaesque uh, controls, deportations, and injustices, and Gaza, which is an open air sewer uh, prison that is periodically bombed by the Israeli Air Force or artillery, uh, resembling nothing so much as the Warsaw Ghetto, ironically. So uh, this is the situation. There is one state. Will the citizens of that state admit the non-citizens to the franchise. I think that is going to be the emerging issue. Ambassador Feltman. One of the, one of the I think really sad aspects of the discussions on the Israeli-Palestinian um, conflict situation in the Security Council, um, was it, became, it was how ritualistic it was. And I saw this during my time as Undersecretary General when the Obama administration was still in power. I also saw it during the about approximately 15 months I still served at the UN after the, after the Trump administration had taken, had taken over. Despite the very stark differences between the policies of the two administrations, one being more even handed, one being shamefully one-sided, um, the Security Council discussions were nevertheless just ritualistic theater with no impact. There is a once a month Security Council um, briefing on the Middle East, which is the euphemism they use for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict under the Security Council agenda. So once a month, the UN, usually the UN Special Coordinator, which up until recently was Nikolai Mladenov, would make a presentation to the Security Council in the, in the chamber and the Security Council members would all give their predictable responses. It had zero impact on the ground. No matter how, I think Nikolai Mladenov was one of the most talented UN officials I worked with over the six years I was at the UN. And his, his briefings were superb, honest, candid assessments, um, but they didn't have any impact. I, I would advocate to the Palestinians, the Palestinians look at these monthly briefings as a sign that the Security Council is engaged on their issues. So this, the Palestinians hold very tightly to the importance of this monthly, just like clockwork briefing. I would argue they're not doing themselves any favors. It would be much more dramatic if the monthly briefings would be canceled in favor of briefings on urgent matters when it's required. That the, that the Secretary General says there's been a, a big settlement announcement. We need to come brief the Security Council on this new settlement announcement. It becomes dramatic. Whereas now what happens, there's a big settlement announcement and everyone just waits for the next monthly briefing. If the monthly briefing had just happened the day before, it's 30 days before the, the um, Secretary General or his representative would condemn the settlement briefings. I think that this monthly ritual of whatever is happening on the ground, having a, having, a, having a Middle East briefing does not highlight the real challenges that the Palestinians face. So I think that you should cancel that monthly briefing in favor of briefings at the request of Security Council members, any member can ask for a briefing or at the UN 
um, to, to more dramatically highlight the problems the Palestinians are facing. While we're on this topic, just one further word. The Palestinians are about to have an election uh, or a series of elections. And um, this is not unimportant because um, to be honest, uh, they have the most ineffectual leadership of any group of people uh, that I can imagine. Uh, they have a president, uh, Raiz, uh, who is, um, what, how many years now? 20 years beyond his original uh, term limit. Um, they have accomplished absolutely nothing in terms of protecting their own population from violations um, and uh, of their human rights. The elections are important. Um, they're important in terms of producing an effective leadership. Uh, we'll see whether that happens or not, but that's pretty key. You know, if the Palestinians can't get their act together to advocate their own interests, why should they expect the rest of the world to do that for them? Excellent point. As a Palestinian American, I can say I agree with that 100%. Um, I would like to give over the last few minutes to our great president, Ambassador Rit uh, Richard Schmier. Ambassador, do you want to ask um, another question or just help close the event? Well, uh, thank you, Vasman. And uh, really, I, I think we're almost out of time, but I would certainly like to uh, echo the, the appreciation that you've given and Gina uh, to our panelists. Um, I had the pleasure of working closely with Jeff uh, when I was the ambassador in Oman, and, and we got the the whole uh, the Iran uh, discussion started. So I think back fondly to that. Um, being the, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Iraq, I certainly agree with your comments uh, on our embassy there. Um, we used to call it Pepperdine on the Tigris, but that's a little bit of a different um, description than you had. Um, and Chaz, of course, thank you uh, for uh, your longstanding support. And, and Nagar, you certainly provided some tremendous insights into the current situation in Iran, which I think is going to be a very strong focus uh, of our policy in the region going forward, a, a lot of changes coming. Uh, so I think we've really had a great conversation this morning. Uh, Gina, thank you for your moderating and um, Basima for your excellent uh, leading of the Q&A. We certainly will welcome any of you back at any time. Uh, we do this on a regular basis, so we'll stay in touch and uh, as Gina mentioned, we'll be putting out a transcript. Uh, this will appear in our journal um, and we'll have a, a video up on our website uh, and, and a summary will be coming around uh, in probably just a few hours. So again, thanks to everyone. Uh, I'll go back to you, Vasma, to, to close out our session. Everyone, thank you so much for participating. This was my first session as executive director of the Middle East Policy Council, and it was such a pleasure. I'm so happy with uh, all of the questions that the audience submitted through our email address and look forward to continuing our robust conversations in the future. Just a reminder, we do the Capitol Hill Conference quarterly, so please keep an eye out for our next invitation and we look forward to your participation then. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you.